Transportation and Projects Committee meeting. I am Julie Pierce, the acting chair. Um, I will call the meeting to order. And the first item on our agenda is public comment. Is there anyone in the audience who wishes to speak on any item not on today's agenda? Seeing no one rush to the speaker's podium, I will close the public comment period and go to the approval of the minutes. Any uh, additions, corrections, or a motion? So, second. I have a motion uh, by Butt, a second by Taylor. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That carries unanimously. Next item is the consent calendar. Anything anyone wishes to pull or a motion? So moved. Motion by Taylor, a second by Arnrich. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That carries unanimously as well. We are on to our regular agenda items, and we are looking forward to a legislative update. We'll turn to Lindsay. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Chair and committee members. Um, you have before you in your packet both a written update from our federal legislative advocates and our state advocate and our state advocate Mark Watts is here this morning, so I'm going to let him give his update. And really briefly on the federal side, um, I just wanted to touch upon a, a few things that we wanted to keep you in the loop on. Um, one, as you are aware, the government was shut down for a period of time and um, may potentially face another shut down in the near future. Um, our, our advocates back there have said this is one of the most un, unpredictable administrations um, that they have seen. So we, we are watching that. Um, it, it has had some effect on some grant applications we're keeping our eye on um, in terms of delays and in getting information out about those. Um, in, in particular, one grant that we are working on is uh, for an automated driving system demonstration grant. Um, and Tim may chat a little more about that later. The applications are due in March, um, but we are watching carefully what, what happens with the government in between now and then, but we are diligently working on our application to have that ready to go by the expected due date. Um, we are also um, planning a trip back to D.C. to visit our delegation and other uh, different folks within the administration in April. Um, we had originally planned to go in February, but given the uncertainty um, our, our advocates recommended, we postponed that to a later date just to make sure that um, we would be able to talk about the things that we wanted to talk about. Um, so that's my very uh, brief report. You know, infrastructure was was mentioned during the recent uh, State of the Union, but there's been no concrete proposals or plans um, brought forward yet. It just continues to be a kind of nebulous discussion item in D.C., so we'll, we'll be happy to provide more information when, when it, there starts to be a more serious plan. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions or turn it over to Mr. Watts. Any questions about the federal side? All right. Mark, you're on. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, uh, Commissioners. Uh, happy to be here this morning. I've got a brief uh, update, and at the end I'll talk about a couple of the bills that have been introduced as well as some of the bills that we are seeking to uh, move forward on your behalf. First and foremost, the Governor has pretty much completed uh, the first round of appointments that are the ones that occupy his 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 office. He's got a Chief of Staff, Anna Leary, um, uh, Anna, J Anna Mata Santos, former fi uh, finance director under Schwarzenegger has come back in as a cabinet secretary. Anthony Williams, who's a prominent uh, former lobbyist who's been working uh, in uh, aerospace the last couple of years, is now the secretary of, of uh, legislation. And for us, uh, uh, Rhonda Pascal, who had been at Cal STA, the transportation agency, she's now in the governor's office as the point of contact for transportation issues. So we're in good shape as far as that goes. The next round of appointments where he will be focusing are all the state agencies. Uh, there's a lot of anxiety, wondering about what's going on with the transportation agencies. I would just point out that this is a same uh, party to same party transition, unlike what, anything we've seen for quite a while. When that happens, uh, there's usually not a big uh, temptation to dump, dump secretaries and department directors. They seem to have uh, survived, and so we, that's my expectation for the secretary and certainly for Director Berman. So we'll see how that, how that rolls out. There are people, however, that are angling for some of those positions, which 
I'm not sure how that's going to turn out for them. The state budget was released by the governor in early January, as you uh, realize. Uh, just as a reminder, it's a $145, $144 billion general fund budget. A key feature of that budget is that there is already a reserve in the total amount of $16 billion, and the Legislative Analyst Office has projected an additional $14.5 billion surplus that would be available mainly for uh, adding to the re reserve, but also doing some of the one-time uh, activities that the governor is starting to talk about. Um, I will note that yesterday the Department of Finance uh, pointed out that the January tax receipts were down a billion. So, you know, this often talked about or spoken about idea of a potential, um, at least budgetary recession affecting the state may be looming, may not. And so gratefully we'll have somewhere between 16 and $30 billion to handle that plus the fact that we passed Prop 69 on top of our already good protected, well-protected funds in transportation, we shouldn't be at the center of any future uh, redirection to balance the state budget. So that's looking pretty good. Uh, in terms of the transportation budget, uh, SB1 was premised on um, uh, an average of about $5.4 billion a year over a 10-year period. And this year we're seeing the $4.8 billion, which is what we expected, being fully allocated to all the different programs. So everybody's uh, pleased about that. Um, the one area in the budget that was super sensitive, and you um, learned about this and have talked about this, I'm sure, at your councils and at uh, the Board of Soups, the um, governor's linkage of housing production to transportation resources. He was pretty direct in the day he released the budget. He since has backed off a bit, but that doesn't mean it's gone away. Uh, he did express intent to conduct a stakeholder meeting. That is still the intention from what we hear. He met personally with the Mobility 21 group, um, which is a big LA transportation organization, and quizzed him on how it could work, what, what are the problems, why he shouldn't do it. It was a really, evidently it was a very good give and take and he learned a lot talking to them. Hopefully he'll, he'll give up, but I don't think so. Uh, cap and trade is the last probably budget item I would mention. Um, they've shown that the annual projection is going to be down from about four billion to the mid to high threes. Um, and however, the governor did not propose any changes to the 60% that's continuously appropriated for high-speed rail, transportation purposes, and affordable housing. The other 40% is always supposed to be subject to the Annual Budget Act, and he's got proposals in that that will be discussed with the legislature. So I won't go into any details there. On the, uh, in the legislature, um, you know, we, we, we saw something unusual this year in December. We had several hundred bills introduced. Uh, normally it's a couple dozen. Um, but interestingly, since that period, the total um, number of bills as of this morning is a little over 700. And I think we can expect well over 2,000 by the time the end of February comes around. So I'll be doing a lot of reading <laughs> and shipping. So we'll see how that goes. Just to call a couple of bills to your attention, probably for future uh, consideration, um, Senator Dodd has introduced the um, – a bill that broadens and extends the uh, federal and state uh, revenue swap. It allows uh, cities and counties to use state funds uh, rather than state and federal funds. It speeds up the, um, the, the um, environmental review process pretty much and takes the feds out of the, out of the uh, oversight. So that's a welcome bill. It's not new policy. It's already on the books, but this expands it to – all communities, not just ones over 200,000 in the state. Uh, Assembly Member Daly from Orange County has a bill that would extend the NEPA delegation that the state enjoys. That requires a, a waiver of sovereign immunity for federal so that if it's a mistake made by a state agency, then the plaintiffs can sue the state as opposed to suing the feds. So, it's the one condition the Fed's imposed upon us. We've accepted it every time it's been in front of us, and he now would extend that authority to have the NEPA program delegated on a permanent basis. So that would probably be worth taking a look at uh, later in the in the session. Several last three bills I would point out: uh, Senator Weiner's uh, SB 127, 
It would create a new division within Caltrans, the Advanced Transportation Program Division, uh, and requires uh, more integration of ATP projects with shop projects. So it will diminish the ability, in my view, of being able to fully fund all the rehab that we need because we'll be doing other things with some of that money. But um, it's, it's an improvement on the bill that he had introduced last year, in my view. Uh, SB 128 by Senator Bell uh, would allow enhanced infrastructure district bond sales to be done without a vote of the people. That's been a bone of contention as IFD and EIFD programs have progressed over the last couple of years. He's taking the ultimate step and saying it's not required at all. We'll have to see how that turns out. And Mr. Grayson has paired up with uh, Assemblymember Sabrina Cervantes from Riverside County. Uh, she had a bill last year that would require the CTC to meet several times a year with the Air Resources Board. This new bill that uh, is mainly authored by uh, Assemblymember Grayson would require um, collaboration in those same sessions with HCD. So you're going to have meetings with Caltrans, HCD, and ARB kind of tying the loop with uh, sustainability and affordable housing and other housing uh, policies. In terms of uh, legislation, I think uh, that we would like to see, um, uh, as expressed in prior board meetings, the uh, ability to extend the tax, uh, sun the, the, the additional tax sunset date beyond 2020 uh, is under consideration by the chairman of the Assembly Transportation Committee. So we'll see. Uh, we've got two and a half weeks before we have to uh, get that bill across the desk. Um, Mr. Grayson is very interested in doing the bill that would authorize this entity to engage in CMGC um, procurement process for use off the state highway system. So he could, you could be in a position to assist your communities with projects that they have uh, as opposed to getting into a, a tug of war with the professional engineers over state highway projects at this point in time. We're going to be building a good track record of success. Caltrans has used this to really good use over the last uh, six or seven years. And so building a good track record, I think at some point we'll be able to do what I think your executive director would like to do, which would extend it to any project that you would have. But right now it's going to be limited to off-system. Um, and last but not least, the County Board of Soups has a bill they're trying to get launched regarding the Iron Horse Trail. Uh, it's been a 35-year travail with uh, a, a re requirement buried in um, the grants. Um, that they would like to get out from underneath. Um, and there's been a lot of research done. Uh, we've uh, identified, because I do some work with the Transportation Water Infrastructure Committee, we've demonstrated that uh, one of the requirements in the grants was for a one-to-one -one match, and the grants totaled ten and a half million, and the county has developed, in terms of the purchase of the right-of-way, 12, over 12, 12 million against that 10.5. So some of the elements have been met and exceeded. The other elements have not been met. So that's going to be um, remain to be worked out between the delegation and, uh, and, and, and the state. And that concludes my report. Any questions, comments? Noel? Uh, thanks, Mark. Uh, it's pretty exciting. I was up there last week meeting with um, – Senator Weiner and some of his folks, um, although it's not directly related, his idea of holding up um, cities SB1. Um, I found, and I don't know what you think, that from all the other, other than his office, every single office, and we went to eight, they all did not like that idea nor support it. Is that what you're hearing? Yes. Um, it, it dates back to the effort he's, uh, that Mr. McCarty introduced last year, um, which was basically the, the genesis of this idea, um, huge um, uh, opposition that, that started at the community level when they heard about it. I was at a RCTC meeting when the bill was introduced last year, and they, they were almost going to pull back their support for SB1 and the SB16 or uh, Prop 69 because of this. Right. So there has been just a, a groundswell, and the groundswell rolled up to CSAC and the league. And 
pretty much stop that bill, and that's what I'm hearing again this year. Yeah, well, I'm glad to hear it on your side. I, I know because I'm on one of the league committees, and they're really pushing hard against it. Um, and one statistic, it wasn't in your report, but you said it verbally. Did you say sales tax statewide is done? No, I'm sorry. The county has the authority for an additional uh, sales tax, and that has a sunset date that ends on No, May? no, I'm sorry, I misspoke. No, uh, you said that statewide sales tax was down $1 billion. Oh, no, no, no. No. Statewide general fund receipts oh, right. across general. the board. Okay. So it's, it's a mix. Yeah. Tax. yeah, I thought I heard uh, sales I tax, and I went, oh, man. I wouldn't. <laughs> Yeah, because sales tax, I thought, was up 1.7%. Yeah, I wouldn't doubt that I fixed my words okay. up. So I Thank you for that, and thanks for all the work you do. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? Yeah, Dave. Have you looked at, uh, and it doesn't seem to approach this group as much, AB, I believe it's 40, Ash Cholera is a co-author, and they want, the state wants to make all sales of vehicles after 2040 electric? If we keep an eye on that one, where it goes. Sometimes they start that way, the next 40 becomes 33. Or Similar bill last year and had to walk away from it. I think he's coming back with a new governor and having better hopes of having some support from the administration. So I think the, the usual folks that would oppose that or will be opposing it very strongly this year because it, it's a real threat. Well, the problem I have, so it doesn't sound like it has anything to do with us, but I'm starting to get calls, I don't know about the rest of you, about these charging stations that are going in, and they're putting them in front, and people are they're complaining. And the report I got yesterday, we're probably a third of where we should be right now in charging stations. And if you're going to go from 125,000 vehicles, their estimate's six million. How fast are you going to be able to get this stuff in, at least here too? And it doesn't. Just doesn't compute when you start thinking about it. Okay, Randy. Commissioners, would you like me to talk a little bit about my interaction with the Bay Area Caucus last Friday? Sure. With, with Mark here. So I was inv We were invited to be part participating with a briefing with the Bay Area Caucus in Sonoma. By the way, that's Sonoma Lodge, or where that that's a nice place. That's got a lot of really nice. So there was five agencies represented uh, that Friday morning. It was us, San Francisco, Napa, Alameda, and Santa Clara. And we each got five minutes to talk a little bit about what we needed from our legislative delegation at state level. So I, I, I said, if you ever do a P3 bill, please include ferry service. We're looking at maybe some competition to WIDA, but we have, because they were talking about, hey, we have to dredge. I said, not if you have a 40-passenger low draft uh, ferry service and or a hydrofoil and the, the new technologies. And so we're open to technology. We want to move people. And I have an update on our ferry service. It's been very successful. And the mayor probably wants to talk about that as well. And then I talked about the need to do CMGC. It's a better cost certainty and schedule certainty. And so, Mark, we need to check in with the union to make sure that when we go for that bill, before we go to that bill, just convince them it's off system, we're not touching the state highway system, so on and so forth. But what it does, it gives us better cost certainty. And every dollar we save, we put on the next project. And then Senator Bell asked, you know, how do we deal with Caltrans? And so I passed the mic to the right, and he said, you're the only one that worked for Caltrans up here, so I want to hear from you first. And our, our point was this. We have a new district director, and, and so there's some things that are changing. We're getting approvals a lot faster and because time is money in construction. So from that perspective, it looks pretty good. But one of the other counties talked about breaking up District 4 into different subregions, and we kind of did that many, many years ago when we had a design squad down in Santa Clara. They had the first tax measure, so they, had, they brought all the engineering staff and the planning staff um, to, to support that effort. And they've disbanded that, and I think they're sending employees back down to San Jose to make sure that we have coordination with, or they have coordination with the sales tax. And then uh, Santa Clara just got approval to release their sales taxes. That was held in escrow. And so that, that, that has uh, changed as well. But it was a good opportunity to, to talk to all of our, our Bay Area delegation about technology, about the future. We're planning the future differently. We actually do the construction. 
and we talked a little bit about ferry service and CMGC. And then outside, our, I think our, I met our new new assembly member. She wants to talk transportation, so I agreed to go. And we're, Lindsay and I are going to head over and meet with, with this new assembly member. I think it was a great opportunity for us. No, this was Friday. It was a Bay Area Council. We were invited by Jim, turned out Jim Frazier, Assembly Member Frazier, wanted an update for his fellow um, legislative members. Because they were there the day before. Just Turn your mic on when you're talking, please. Yeah, so that was, the, they had several different uh, pockets of whatever the, the topic was. In our case, it was early in the morning and it was on transportation. So we just gave them uh, probably 35 minutes, 40 minutes of an update. And it wasn't a complaining session, really was very constructive about things that we need from our legislature. I said I would be remiss if I gave a presentation and didn't, yet, didn't relay what we want. We need a sales tax extension. We want ferry service uh, added to any P3 bill. We want CMGC. And these are things that, that our board has is, is asked for because it, it's not trying to mess up the apple cart, but it's trying to get better schedule certainty, better cost certainty, and certainly better service for our, our um, traveling public, they want options. They just don't have options other than their single occupant vehicle. And so we've got some great examples of, of transit operations. I, we extended BART out to Hillcrest. The people are waiting on, on the on the platform, and then our ferry service is, is successful. It's over 10,000 yeah. riders already. I mean, it's yeah. doing everything that yeah, it's about it says it should do. What they thought, right? It's actually exceeding uh, the, what South San Francisco ferry service, and that's been in effect for seven, seven years now, Peter? And I believe we have a representative from AGC. So she is the, the newest uh, member of the Association of General Contractors who, whose members are, they do our work, they build our infrastructure. And Kim is now the Bay Area's government relations person. Wonderful. So Welcome. We Thank you for coming. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Well, it sounds like we have a, a pretty good slate of things that we're going to be following up on as they evolve and become a little more concrete. Um, and so we'll look forward to that. And hopefully we can uh, keep the governor from sort of thumbing his nose at what the public voted for on uh, SB1, especially after November ratified what it was originally intended for, I think the public would rise up if they felt they were being disrespected by changing the intent of the bill. That's my little editorial comment. Um, so anything else that anyone wants to mention under legislation? All right. Going to item 11. Thank you, Mark. Have a good, safe trip back to Sacramento. Keep at it. Uh, item 11 is the approval of a lump sum payment to CalPERS, and we have a report from Brian Kelleher. Congratulations. Well, he's getting ready. Congratulations yeah, for <laughs> your, your new appointment. We are welcoming you as our new CFO. We appreciate your, uh, your longevity with us, and it's a very smooth transition as far as we're concerned. This is great. Thanks, Brian. Thank you very much. Um, good morning, uh, Chair and Commissioners. Um, obviously, I'm Brian Kelleher, the new Chief Financial Officer. So today in front of you, we have the approval of the lump sum payment to CalPERS to pay off the authority's unfunded liability. Um, So there's many factors that make up the unfunded liability. <clears throat> and the, the main component is the discount rate. I'm not going to read through all of the details in here. I handed these out as well. Uh, but the discount rate is the long-term interest rate used to fund the future pension benefits. The, dis the discount rate is also known as the assumed rate of return that CalPERS expects investments to earn during the fiscal year. Um, as we move through the presentation on the probably uh, two more slides, we'll see the interest earnings that historically have been at CalPERS. That plays a major component into this. Uh, but back in December of 2016, the CalPERS Board of Administration decided to lower the discount rate from 7.5% to 7% over a three-year term. And so they were going to phase it in. Um, so, so the authority is, the expected rate of return is lowering. 
Um, and therefore, the effect on CCTA is our the, the contribution rate on the authority side is going to increase to make up the difference. Um, and one of the main components for the discount rate is the additional contributions from participating agencies, as I just mentioned, would help offset pay the pensions. Um, it reduces the risk for the CalPERS that we're going to have a higher unfunded statewide and effect on the individual agencies and the authority itself. So our funding history. So back in May of 2015, the authority approved Resolution 1517A, and we paid off about $2.2 million of the unfunded liability. That brought us up to about 100% in May of 2015. And when they brought in the interest rates from CalPERS, their expected rate of return from that fiscal year, it brought us into 97.6%. Um, this this uh, presentation right here shows just the classic employee side. So we have two, two components. We have classic employees and we have prepper employees. Um, and probably 90% of our employees are classic, and that is changing over time. Um, so as we go through 2016 when they did it, we're, we dropped down to 90%, and then in 2017 we dropped down to about 92%. Um, as we, as we discussed, uh, Cal CalPERS has about $354 billion, and they're very well diversified. Um, and with that diversification, as you can see in the chart that shows about 10 years of history, back in 2009, um, they lost about 24%. Um, and again, the discount rate was 7.5%. Um, and as you can see through the next 10 years, when we get to about 2015 and we get to 2016, the CalPERS net investment return dropped below the discount rate, and it shows 2.4% in 2015, and then it even got lower to 0.6% um, in 2016. In 2017, we have 11.2%, and we have 8.6%. And so what I wanted to do was just show the difference. Um, the authority has two two sources of investments. We have our liquid cash that's in LAIF, um, and that that historically has shown over the last 10 years is about 0.7% interest. We, we earn on the money there. Right now, currently, we're earning about 2.34% on our money on a, on a daily basis there. And then we also have a bulk of our investments um, in U.S. Treasuries, and we have the one to three year Treasury benchmark. And historically, over the last 10 years, that's about 2.5%. So if you were just to take a million dollars and you were to leave it in LAIF, you would have earned about $68,000. That's not compounding the interest in there, but just a, a basic average. And then if the one to three year treasury mark, we would have had about 251. But if we had had um, our money in CalPERS, um, we would have earned about $655,000. But then again, if they, they're, they're very well diversified, but you can see Back in 2009, they lost 24%. So there is risk in being fully funded as well. But there is also the benefit of being fully funded, and you can earn extra interest in CalPERS than you typically would earn um, on our side. So the CalPERS, uh, CalPERS amortization, it's just like um, your basic mortgage. You can either have a 30-year amortization, you can have a 20-year or a 15-year. Um, but the advantages of paying it off now, you can see that um, the interest paid, uh, we, every agency, we all make annual payments to help get caught up. And if we were to continue down that road, we would pay about $1.5 million in interest. Um, so there's the advantage of paying off the balance now. So we would pay off about $1.2 million, save about $1.5, $1.6 million today. So the proposed uh, funding source on this would be Measure C. Um, the Measure C contingency reserve has about $4.2 million in there right now. Um, utilizing um, these funds would very, be very prudent of the agency um, to fund our liability and, can, and have the cost savings of the interest uh, that would be paid over the next 30 years. So staff recommends we move this forward to the authority. Um, and. Anybody have any questions? Questions? Yeah, Tom. Um, I, I didn't see this PowerPoint in the agenda packet. Could, could you email it to, 
to me and anybody else who wants it. I'd like to share it with some people. Yeah. Right. Yes, I'd be more than happy to. Um, Go ahead, Neil. Yeah, I, Brian, uh, uh, I know this is this is your first big assignment, but you were working on this before, as we talked about. Uh, this is the right thing to do. As I mentioned before, we, we have a sunset for our agency, so we have to be fully funded before. If we ever get to that, I hope we never do. But um, this is the right thing to do, and I think this is very prudent. And that math that you just did, we kept the money in the bank. We're barely going to get 2 to 2.5% 2 versus invested again in the CalPERS, and we know we're getting, they're guaranteeing us. Um, uh, a rate of return. So this makes sense. I, I'd move the item, and I appreciate your work on it. Second. With a okay. I, I have second. a motion by Arnrich and a second by Hudson with a comment. Yes, the, uh, the request to have the, the slideshow sent to uh, Mayor Butt, would you also send it to the two representatives from the Board of Supervisors? And I also... <clears throat> Just, you're going to give the same presentation to the full board, I assume? Yes, I can make any changes you would no, like No, no, I'm not looking at changes. More in a preparation when it has the first page effect on CCTA. It talks about how much it's going up. Just be prepared for how much the employee is putting in. The employees have, a, um, here at the authority, we, we pay our 7%. Um, you know, it's very typical among most of the authorities and agencies and, and Brian I, di I didn't need an answer I just said be prepared Brian also could you send this because we're, we're we're in the process of doing some of this right now as we speak with the city uh, make sure that uh, Carrie gets this please yes sir I'm um, you know, I, I shared this um, staff report with my city staff yesterday, and they came back with an absolutely opposite answer. And apparently there are quite a few in our county who are very opposed to this because they feel they're tying their money up <clears throat> with CalPERS when the price is always going to go up. And so they figure it's, it's sort of like a mortgage that's varying. You just pay the minimum and keep paying. And... You'll keep paying forever, and they don't see that they're actually saving money. So whatever we can do as we're talking with our other agencies in the county to explain how we're actually saving it, because the, the tag end at the end was um, CCTA should use sales tax monies for its primary intended purpose, local transportation projects. And they're not seeing how this is freeing up money to use for transportation projects, how we actually have more money doing this. So somehow we need to simplify the explanation, probably for the entire board as well, to make it, you know, maybe even boxes, I don't know, some graphic that can better diagram um, how we're actually winding up with more money in the end. I, I, I just, I think it's a hard concept for a lot of people to get because Every time you pay it off, the bill goes up again anyway. It's not like you're really paid off. There's, they, they recalculate every two years. We know that, and we always know that we're going to get a new bill. So whatever we have to do to explain this, to show the benefit more graphically, I think would be very helpful when we come to the board discussion. How much is your annual liability? About a million and a half. And what's your annual? What's your uh, general fund budget? Uh, about four and a half. Yeah, and that's why. Yeah. Employee groups are the single reason we have unfunded liabilities yeah. because they don't want to pay it because there's less money for them yeah. in current operations. You couldn't pay it. Well, does it mean you shouldn't? Unless we you're in the we right could pool. take it. We could take it out of reserves if we had to. But right. their their argument is is just going to build back up it's again their argument. Because, because of their the argument. small. Um, agency pool that we're oh. in and the liability that they keep running into they keep running the bills up so anyway but just my my comment because we we are getting a little pushback I know that the um, uh, municipal pooling authority had this on their agenda and he mentioned it and he said that there were four of the finance managers and two city managers 
cut off even the presentation of the item to say absolutely not. It's, and uh, so, it's and so, you know, I, I think we need to be able to explain it to our policy makers why this is important, so they can carry that message back home for when it does apply. Yeah. So, I appreciate we have a motion and a second on the floor. Any but, other comments? Yeah, just yes. one. See, it's a little bit different when you live near a town that's 100% funded, because you're constantly reading about it in the paper. So you have to you have to aspire to be up with the Joneses. So I whenever understand. the the opportunity so comes along, we no well we're 107 percent on the on the what's the other thing the OPEB. Yeah. And I tried to pitch it at the air district, and like you said, you get the pushback until you realize. Do you understand? The press can't come after you on this if you get it, and you're gaining on the other end. Yeah. If you can get to 100 and you're actually not losing money on the deal, do it. Yeah. Oh, I, I don't disagree, but it's an uphill battle when you try to discuss it. So uh, just be ready. Thank you, Brian. Um, if there are no other comments, all in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Opp oppose. That carries unanimously. Thank you very much. We are on to the event of the day, the Richmond San Rafael Bridge. Who's going to kick this off? Tim? There you are. Good morning, Chair and Commissioners. Uh, my name is Tim Hale, the Deputy Executive Director for Projects at the Authority, and I'm here to provide an update on the Richmond Santa Fe Bridge Access Improvement Projects. CCTA, BATA, and TAM have been partnering together on a multitude of projects on the bridge. Um, the peak period use lane opened in April of 2018 and has improved congestion in the eastbound direction significantly, reducing delay. And now the big focus between the agencies is really um, completing the bike path in the westbound direction on the upper deck, um, which is anticipated to be completed in May of, of 2019. So since the peak period use lane has opened, um, there's been significant reduction in average delay, um, equivalent to 104 days of motorist travel every single weekday um, with that peak period use lane in the eastbound direction. So it's obviously it's a big success. Um, the upper deck bike path will be um, using the outside shoulder, be protected by a movable barrier. Um, the construction of the movable barrier um, was completed in December of 2018, and the bike path was agreed to be a four-year pilot project um, to evaluate its success to provide alternative modes over the bridge and, com and also complete um, this, this section of Bay Trail. Um, however, in January 2019, TAM, um, Transportation Authority of Marin, um, has requested the evaluation pilot to be reduced from four years to six months. Critical to the success of the bike path is closing the gaps on both the Marin side and the Richmond side. So MTC and TAM have been working together to complete the interim bike improvements on Main Street, Francisco Boulevard, and MTC is working on the ultimate improvements to provide a 10-foot trail um, along Francisco Boulevard to be completed in spring of 2020. TAM is committed in really taking the lead on providing a concrete barrier to protect bicyclists over the Sir Francis Drake connector, um, and unfortunately that's on hold at the moment due to funding. So the City of Richmond has been really instrumental in completing the design and advertising the construction to complete the interim bike improvements um, in Richmond, and those improvements are along um, essentially the Greenway, Gerard Boulevard, and through Point Richmond to get over to Castle Street to connect to the bridge. And the interim improvements in Richmond will, are, are intended to really provide better access to the bridge from Richmond Ferry, El Cerrito del Norte BART Station, Richmond BART Station, and really provide that access, total access to the bridge. The City of Richmond is also working on establishing an e-bike share program to support the usage of the bike path and connection to BART transit and ferry. CCTA is partnering with Scoop and Miles, some of our previous partners, to provide incentives to encourage the use of bikes across the bridge. And all of this work is really to support the successful evaluation of the four-year pilot of the bike path. So in response to some of TAM's requests, a westbound study was completed to determine feasibility of an additional third lane in the westbound direction, along with the additional, the movable barrier that will be in place for the bike path. 
and the shoulder would be open during traffic during the peak period, and be and then the movable barrier would be moved, and the and the shoulder would be open for bikes during the off peak periods during the day. And TAM has requested an analysis of the bridge to determine what structural upgrades would be necessary to hold that additional load. So the bridge was never intended to have a concrete barrier and three lanes of traffic on the upper deck. And so there has to be additional analysis to determine the structural capacity and feasibility um, and improvements to the bridge in order to support that additional loading on the bridge. So as illustrated in this graphic, the red represents the delays and queues at the Richmond Toll Plaza at the upper right. And adding the third lane and converting the toll plaza to open road tolling would essentially move the queue from the Richmond side of the bridge basically on the bridge in the Marin side. And so to further reduce the queue and congestion, MTC and CCTA have been partnered on Richmond Centerfield Forward uh, program of projects. And really the goal of this program is to create mode shifts in the corridor um, using bikes, carpools, and additional transit. So we're not asking everyone to create to, to, to take alternative modes of transportation. So as we've been talking about the authority to just get 10% reduction in mode, sh in, in, mo in mode shift across the bridge would um, reduce by 400 cars, which would significantly improve congestion on the, on the bridge. And so in 2019, so this is, this is the Richmond Center fell forward a suite of programs and initiatives. Um, on the left side is what we're trying to focus on in 2019. Um, these are all the incentives that we're working on in terms of ways carpool scoop, um, as well as providing rebates for e-bikes across the bridge, as well as MTCs working closely with Loom, which is a employer commute management company um, that will connect um, employees together for all, to carpools and and transit. Um, and in 2021, um, MTC and Bat are looking at converting the Richmond uh, Toll Plaza to open road tolling as well as extend the HOV lane all the way to Central Avenue to provide a bypass and better access for HOVs and transit um, through the toll plaza and in, onto the bridge, as well as increase transit frequency with Golden Gate trans Transit. Um, and then we all know that Richmond Parkway is also congested, and so we want to provide um, technologies in the corridor, which we're calling Smart Richmond Parkway, the adaptive signals to provide better traffic flow on the Richmond Parkway as well as continue closing all of those bike gaps um, um, in the bike network in Richmond to provide that, that access for BART, transit, and, and the ferry. So that really concludes my presentation, and so I want to provide Randy an opportunity to add in, and also Commissioner Butt to provide any opportunities to add any, any comments. Other comments? Tom. Well, just to, we, we've had a, a little bit of a dust up over the last uh, several weeks because uh, some of our Marin friends and the and the Transportation Authority of Marin uh, brought forth a, a resolution um, asking MTC to evaluate the success of the bike lane after six months, and I think that what people gathered from that was that that uh, the idea was that they would evaluate it after six months when it's hardly had time to gear up and they would conclude that it's not getting much use and then, you know, and then they would move to go away with it. But I think the reality of it is that, is that um, it, would, it would take years to do that for a lot of reasons that some of which were alluded to in here. And uh, we, we had a meeting yesterday to talk about it. And I think what it boils down to is they're, they're getting pressure from some of their constituents in the business community to do something. And I think this, um, this, this letter and this resolution was just so they could, they could take some fresh meat back to the business community and say, look, this is, this is what we're doing for you. But it, it really doesn't mean much. And uh, we, we agreed that uh, MTC would draft some kind of a joint statement that hopefully we'd all sign on to that kind of explains this. That, I mean, we said, look, we don't care if you evaluate it the first day, the first month, first week, six months, one year, we're all for that. We'd, we'd like to have a constant evaluation of how it's doing, but we don't want to lead people to believe that in six months, if there's not enough bike traffic, that we're going to, um, you know, that we're going to abandon it. 
and the practicality of abandoning it is it's just not there and I think that one thing people are coming to realize which was showed in that slide is that if you opened up three lanes today you just move the congestion from in front of my house to in front of Damon Connolly's house you know <laughs> that's all that would happen I mean I told him I said look we got four months till this, or three, three months, four months till this bike lane. Why don't you just open up three lanes right now and let's show people what's going to happen? And um, I, you know, I don't think that's going to happen. But, but anyway, anyway, I appreciate all the support I got from Randy and the CCTA staff staff on this. It was very helpful. Dave. Yeah, I think your point of you, you can study it, you can review it, you can do whatever you want day one or every day if you want but what you really have to do is understand what their those numbers are showing you when we opened up the pilot program on the peninsula uh we be in the air district this time i think there was 400 bikes and i was wondering if we were ever going to have to do it again and the company was going to go out of business i mean you might show there was zero the day you opened it you might have had five the first day uh 12 six months later and that isn't impressive what it shows you is the curve goes like that because we had to go from 400 bikes to 1,000 bikes and MTC took it away and I think you're still at 7,000 and climbing. I, watching the Washington DC when I first saw it, I go, does anybody ever take one of these bikes? Came back a year later and the racks were empty. Now whichever city you go to, the, the racks are empty. It's not just straight linear. It goes up like that. So, I mean, you got to hold your ground on this one, Tom. Okay, I actually had, a, oh, Randy, go I, ahead. I just want to add a couple, couple points. One, Chris is here. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to be here to answer any questions. That, that's really a show of support for this, this effort. So that, that's positive news. The thing that I heard at the end of the, because I, I dialed in via phone, is I think at the last minute of RM3 negotiations on the Richmond-San Rafael Bridge, the whole corridor, those dollars that were set aside, we have an understanding that there's $75 million that we, CCTA, will help program to deal with issues on the western side. What I heard is now BATA is saying that they, or MTC staff, is saying that they have the decision-making on that $75 million. That's, that's what I heard. And so I, 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 I texted um, Amy Worth was in the meeting at the time, so mm -hmm. I texted her. We need to get clarification about that because I think that we have a plan to move forward and, with Chris and, and Tim, you know, there's a plan on how to deal with this congestion at Richmond Parkway and in the, the Toll Plaza. I think we really need to get clarification on who programs these projects in the future because that was part and parcel to getting us closer to our 18.4 percent. That's right. No. Uh, just maybe a clarification. I'm not sure it was accurate um, when you said, Tim, that there were um, the bridge was not designed for three lanes. It used to be three lanes. It was designed for three lanes on the upper deck, it, it, but when you, it wasn't designed for three lanes in a movable concrete yeah, area. Yeah, right. The way I heard that, though, you said it wasn't designed because I used to yeah. commute across that before yeah. they put the temporary water line in there, yeah. Yeah. and then our traffic backed up. But um, anyway, I just want to make sure to, because if somebody hears it that way, you're going to get criticism for. So when will that evaluation be done? Whether the additional load of the movable barrier is is overwhelming its So there's capacity. been discussions with Caltrans to dec decide how that study is going to be funded and then there will be a schedule provider. Right now it's just undetermined. So it hasn't even been done it yet. Been, yeah, no, it hasn't been done yet. Okay. Let me add something. So Chris, there's more than just adding, uh, doing a, a dead load calculation and the impacts of sliding that barrier back and forth on a daily basis. There's also the requirement of, of wind loading on potential gantries that are going to go across that bridge as well to manage traffic. Is that correct? So it's not just a matter of sliding that barrier back and forth. Welcome, Chris. Yeah, thank you. My name is Chris Lilly with the, with the Metropolitan Transportation Commission and also with the Bay Area Toll Authority. Um, so I, I would say that, yeah, Randy is correct. Um, if you looked at the peak period use lane on the lower deck, because it's a, it's a stacked bridge, right, where you have um, one direction of travel um, above the other direction of travel, for the peak period use lane, all of the uh, infrastructure was installed on the uh, 
uh, drive-through truss portion of the bridge, so you already had a portion of the structure to mount it to. And on the upper deck, because you only have a very limited space where the, um, the bridge superstructure is above the bridge deck, uh, you would have to mount separate gantries for any peak period use uh, lane in the upper deck. So it would be more than just the uh, dead load analysis. That's correct, Randy. And so these through truss structures, you, you, you have wind loading factors, and, and then the deck is thin. So when I was the district director in 2001, 2002, the retrofit of that bridge was going on, and they micropiled, micropiled through the existing foundations, and they try to strengthen and replace that, that, that deck. Well, the deck is thin. It's... it's it's, you're going to put loading on it that it's not used to. Speaking of it like a human, I guess, but you're going to end up getting potential loading on the deck as well that, you're, that the bridge isn't used to, and you can accelerate cracking, and then how do you deal with replacement of that deck in the future? So there's all these factors that have to be analyzed, correct, Chris? <clears throat> yeah, it is a, it's a detailed analysis that would be required for sure. Well, I, I thought another factor, too, was just the fact that the bridge was designed in you know, it was designed in probably 1950, and uh, you, you know when you go. So uh, supposedly, I mean, presumably it it conformed to industry standards at that time. But now we're, you know, we're 70 years later, and um, uh, so when when they opened up the the lane on the on the lower deck. They were going from four lanes to five when it's fully occupied. So that's a 25% increase. When you go from when you go from two to six, that's a 50% increase in loading. I, th I thought that was something they needed to take a look at too. Yeah, I'm not sure of those details. Um, yeah. I, I guess I would ask a further question: If we're moving the backup from Richmond onto the bridge itself, it seems to me that the static load then is even increased because it was planned to have the traffic continually moving, not parked on the bridge. Yeah, but it was probably not designed for the kind of traffic it's getting today. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I, I just, I mean, we've done the seismic retrofit, so that supposedly beefed it up considerably. The classic example of what you're talking about is the Golden Gate Bridge and its anniversary. Yeah, when, when it the de But yeah. that is a different dead load than this. Cal nobody calculates it from a bridge perspective that you're going to have a gazillion people all standing next to each other right. loading that yeah, structure. Yeah, because that's a much but heavier load. But they do calculate load. for dead loading of vehicles. Okay, okay. Well, um, we'll look forward to additional progress reports. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, uh, Tim. Anything Final mayor, we're good. Okay, very good. Thank you. That can. There's no uh, action required on this. That was an informational um, item, and we will look forward to the opening of the bike lane coming up. Hopefully, April, May. Is that what the schedule is? Um, yeah, it'll, that, I think they. They figured they could open up as early as late May, and we, we were thinking, you know, maybe make it coincide with Bike to Work Day, which is May 9th. That would be cool. <laughs> that would be cool. It would be awesome. All right, very good. Um, that concludes the business items on our agenda. We have some correspondence and news clippings. We have uh, next item is commissioner and staff comments. I have no comments or reports. Commissioner comments or reports about activities or meetings? D Dave. Just a quick, I've never gone to this orientation thing that they do for council members and mayors until I needed to do my AB1234, which in case you need to do it, Terry Ann might be bugging right. And I'm amazed at some of the common things you hear. I had to go to Irvine in Southern California and some of the different problems that they relate to up there. I, did, I thought CASA was Bay Area for whatever reason. It's not. <laughs> oh, it was the number one thing. Mm -hmm. the, they put up a thing, and you, with your little phone, tell them what's the most important thing to you. Northern California was housing. Southern California was housing. Yeah. It's statewide. Watch the bills, folks. There's yeah. something going on. They're, they're coming. They're coming. Any other commissioner comments? Executive staff comments? 
Commissioners, uh, Jack Hall is now hosting three high school teachers again. This is about the third or fourth time he's done it. And they, they're interested in technology and making sure that the, the students are, are getting the right curriculum to deal with the future technology. So he has three teachers out at Gomentum Station. They'll shadow him all day long. So awesome. it's part of our STEM, STEM initiative. That's terrific. All righty. Well, if there's no other business, we are adjourned to our next meeting on Thursday, March 7th at 8.30 a.m. Thank you all.